Well, thank you for coming. My name is Pete Besson. I'm a second year master's student here at SIU. I work with larval and juvenile yellow perch. A lot of that work has involved live feeds, um, specifically rotifers and artemia. So today I'll be talking to you specifically about decapsulated artemia um, and its support for replacing rotifers um, altogether in the production of yellow perch. So traditionally, uh, rotifers have been used as a first food source for many larval species. Uh, they're highly reproductive, they can be cultured in high densities, um, and continually see harvested. Um, these live feed regimens in yellow perch pond culture can last 30 to 60 days, um, as well in indoor systems, um, in tandem tank systems, it can be about a month, um, in RAS systems, and in tank culture, it's also been seen uh, as short as four days. Uh, so. Uh, so these, these times are highly variable um, in terms of live feeds. Um, it all depends on the environment for the live feed, uh, the density of the larvae, um, and their ability to find, find these live feeds um, in the water. Uh, the rotifers do provide the proper size of feed for the mini larval fish, um, including yellow perch. Uh, the yellow perch uh, mouth size is around this 130 to 190 millimeters. Um, and so it is an optimal in terms of, in terms of size for the fish. Um, they can ingest it, uh, they can digest it as well and utilize it. Uh, better than better than any of the dry feeds so far in terms of yellow perch culture. Uh, so one of the issues with, with live feed is uh, just across the board is you're, you're essentially uh, culturing three different systems um, in tandem um, while while trying to produce these larval fish, which are already uh, you know needy enough in terms of labor um, and effort. Um, and so these rotifers are just another vector for pathogens to be added to to your facility. Um, and so if we can if we can replace them um, in any way, um, it can be beneficial to the to the industry. Um, as well, rotifers have to be cultured year round, so uh, the potential for them to crash um, is, is greater. Um, they are especially more sensitive um, to to the culture environment, so um, any any adjustment or uh, misadjustment to to the system could could cause it to crash. Um, and especially around the time when you want to start your production, uh, this could be detrimental. Um, if you don't have, obviously don't have feed for your fish, uh, you're going to have high mortality. Um, and if you're uncertain about if your culture is going to work, um, that can just cause um, unnecessary stress um, for yourself and for the fish. Um, as well, the artemia, um, they offer better control over this production. Um, as well, they're, they're cultured in smaller containers. So if you lose one artemia jar or one cone, um, you know, you're not, you're not out of the, you're not um, out of luck. You know, you you've got plenty of other jars. Um, to siphon out, hopefully, um, utilize. Um, a lot of the rotifer cultures are done in, in big, big tanks, um, so it's sort of an all or nothing, and it, as well, it just takes up more space. Um, so being able to cut down on space, um, utilize it for other things, um, as well as having that sort of risk mitigated in terms of losing one culture, um, it is greater in Artemia. So it's it's got great potential in terms of, of replacement um, and utilization in many larval fish. So. This study looked at decapsulating artemia, and this just essentially is chemically removing uh, the outer shell, leaving the embryo and membrane of that cyst. Um, so when decapsulated artemia can hatch at smaller sizes due to this, due to this process, uh, so they have that soft membrane, um, and that allows for them to hatch at, at a smaller size, and therefore uh, we think it can ha have them hatch at a size that is um, edible and digestible for, for those small larvae mouth sizes. Um, it also allows for these cysts of lower quality to hatch um, if, if there's a less fit. Uh, Artemia, it might not hatch in under traditional conditions, um, but if we dissolve that membrane, we can potentially get more hatched out of out of the same amount of Artemia that we would in a traditional uh, setting. Um, it also disinfects the cysts, so this this process uses uh, bleach, so it minimizes that bacterial risk and introduction that, that may be present in rotifers. Um, and as I mentioned, that this process, um, it, it creates a smaller hatch size um, of Artemia, so it, we believe it could be uh, ingested and well utilized in, in larval fish from, from first feeding. It wasn't clear yet. The, the goal of the study was to determine if decapsulating Artemia could sufficiently replace and remove traditional water for feedings without inhibiting any larval yellow perch performance. So our design for this study, uh, we had two feed groups, three replicates. We fed four to six times per day to satiation, um, and 65 larvae per liter in 280 liter tanks. Uh, the study ran from nine days post-hatch to 32 days post-hatch. Decapsulation procedure, just briefly. Um, so we have our hatching cone here on the left. Uh, we add our hydrated cysts. We intensely aerate that for an hour and a half. 
Um, and then from there, we add salt water and liquid chlorine, uh, sodium hydroxide, and fresh water. Um, this will start an exothermic process, uh, so it'll heat up, and so you'll want to be close by watching it uh, for two to four minutes. Uh, from there, it'll turn from a brown brownish color in that cone to an orangish color, and that's when that's sort of your signal to add this sodium thiosulfate and fresh water uh, for about 15 seconds, and that, that stops that process. Um, and from there, you're ready to go. You can drain your cone uh, through a through a 120 milliliter screen, uh, remove that excess water, and store for up to seven days. Um, and from there, you're able to add this mixture uh, to a hatching cone, uh, about three grams per liter, uh, for 16 hours at 25 to 30 degrees Celsius and 25 ppt, uh, with with one ppt of uh, bicarbonate. Um, so compared to traditional hatching uh, with the cyst, uh, it's it's quite a bit shorter, uh, about eight hours shorter in hatching. Um, as well, you don't have to siphon out the cysts uh, like you would uh, in the traditional setting. Uh, you can just it's really siphon out very easily and quickly um, all those hatched artemia. And so our rearing system, uh, we have a few modifications to help us uh, negate some of those uh, challenges to larval rearing. Uh, we have clay added here uh, to minimize cannibalism and also reduce cleaning behavior. Uh, the cleaning behavior, they sort of stack up on the walls here. Uh, it's sort of a function of light refraction um, as well as um, being scared in the tank from other fish. There's inevitably going to be uh, cannibals um, in production, and so this can help sort of uh, camouflage other fish um, and, and help with stress-related symptoms. Um, as well, our sprayers, so these are what disperse the clay, uh, so at 45 and 90 degrees here. Um, they also break the surface tension of the water to um, make it easier for these fragile larvae to gulp air and increase their, and inflate their swim bladders. Uh, in our system, we did have 100% swim bladder inflation um, across the board. Um, as well, we also have these screens, which are variable in size. So a larger screen size up here, one millimeter, uh, to allow for the passage of oils. Uh, so as the swim bladders are inflating, um, as well as feeding um, higher and higher amounts that allows for that passage of oils through that top screen. Uh, and then below the water surface, uh, we have a half millimeter screen uh, to prevent, obviously, the larvae from leaving the tanks. Um, and then lastly, we have our laminar flow. Uh, so this is really prolonging our availability of the feed in the water, um, creating a, a more flat flowing uh, system. And then lastly, our uh, lights above the tanks. These are our feeding cues for the larvae. Um, they're attracted to this light source. So during feedings, we'll turn this on, um, allow them to feed. It also allows us to see more easily into the tanks. Um, and then all of the hours they'll be dimmed. Um, and so this is really a, a cue for the larvae to feed. Um, and as, as we've seen, it, it is beneficial to the to the success of the production. Um, as well, our, our temperature was 18 to 22 degrees Celsius. Uh, our pH was seven to seven and a half. Um, and our salinity during our live feed was one to two PPT. Uh, and this really prolongs the, those marine organisms, uh, prolongs their life uh, just, just slightly in the water longer, um, allows for those larvae to find it uh, for a little bit longer, allows those live feet to swim around and be attracted to the larvae a bit longer. Um, and lastly, uh, our, our liters per minute here on the laminar flow, we did increase this uh, towards the end of the study from two to three, uh, and then later to uh, around five liters per minute. Our feeding protocol here, so from uh, so we fed rotifers um, in our in our one group from 9 to 11 dph, um, and then on our decap group we fed our decapsulated San Francisco strain of Artemia. So this San Francisco strain is slightly smaller than this Great Salt Lake strain. Um, and then from 11 uh, to 17 dph, after we had transitioned, uh, we we're feeding um, decapsulated Great Salt Lake Artemia uh, in both groups. Um, and then there from 17 to 21, uh, we're challenging them with dry feeds. Um, just to observe um, how well they're accepting this dry feed or if they can accept it um, in any different ways um, across the groups. So our results, when we looked at our average daily mortality uh, after we had transitioned, uh, very comparable uh, among the groups throughout the study, uh, really no, no, no significant differences in mortality, uh, except for here at the beginning. Uh, we did see our Rotifer group uh, experience uh, significantly higher mortality um, in this first day um, compared to the DCAP group. Um, as well, we saw um, survival was higher in the decapsulated group, no significant differences, uh, but our survival was around 56% in the DCAP group and 53% in the Rotifer group. Uh, so we did see significant differences here at the initial uh, sampling. 
uh, between the groups. So our rotifer group here, uh, these first two days of feeding of these different diets, the rotifer group was significantly uh, less heavy than the decap group uh, by about uh, one milligram. And then towards the end of the study, you can see the head start. Uh, there was a strong trend in terms of the decap group being uh, around three to four milligrams heavier compared to the rotifer group. And then our uh, length gains for the for the groups, uh, there was no significant differences here, uh, but we can see our growth rates were very similar um, between the two groups. Um, as well, we saw a strong trend here at the beginning of the study. Our lengths uh, for the larvae were were um, around around two millimeters larger uh, for the decap group compared to the rotifer group. Uh, and then here we see they ended um, about a millimeter apart in terms of length um, at the end of the study. One last interesting thing we found when we measured our live feeds, so here are our Timia and our rotifers, uh, we found significantly different uh, lengths and widths uh, between the feeds, um, especially looking at this decapsulated group of San Francisco strain and rotifer strain. So the two we started with at first feeding, uh, their widths are comparable, but their lengths are vastly different. Um, and so we think this could point to uh, the larvae being able to orient them themselves. Um, in the water to the prey and fit that prey in their mouth, um, especially when it's decapsulated and this width is slightly smaller, um, especially compared to this San Francisco strain, not decapsulated. So same strain, um, just one's decapsulated, one not. Um, when we look at look at it that way, we can see that there's 190, if we remember, that's about the limit to uh, the mouth size of, of the yellow perch larvae. Um, so it could be possibly there's just a little more wiggle room here on the width. Um, in terms of fitting that in their mouth. Um, it could be the, the wings are, are blocking the larvae from ingesting that, that prey um, at these larger sizes. Um, especially when we look at these larger strains, um, they, are, they are significantly larger um, compared to this decapsulated San Francisco strain. So just something to think about in terms of not only does our feed maybe need to be species and life stage specific, um, but also the type of life feed we're using could make a difference in terms of which which life stage they're in and which strain of live feed we're using in production. So just in conclusion, the yellow perch larvae in the decap group exhibited significant differences in weight following first feeding of the decapsulated San Francisco strain artemia compared to the rotifer group. Uh, next, the yellow perch, uh, we found they could receive this decapsulated San Francisco strain from first feeding and it didn't have any significant uh, inhibition to growth or survival. Um, another thing we found sort of at the end there was when we measure a live feed, uh, we think maybe the ingestion of the live prey uh, could be limited to just one dimension. and Maybe those larvae can uh, orient themselves to ingest that feed uh, when there's a little wiggle room there on the width uh, to, to really fit that prey in their mouth. Um, and um, as well, removing these rotifer cultures, it relieves labor, uh, facility space, um, and biosecurity risks. So any way we can can help ourselves um, in terms of labor um, and, and free space and uh, extra room for production, um, we'd like to take advantage of that. So it was, it was promising to find these results uh, in terms of the future of yellow perch culture, um, as well as the ease of yellow perch culture. Um, thank you all for coming today. I appreciate your time. Feel free to reach out with any questions. Uh, thank you. Have a good day.